to the 13th meeting of 2015, the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, remind people not to uh, leave their mobile phones switched on as they can affect the broadcasting system. Uh, you may notice some committee members consulting tablets during the meeting. This is because they provide meeting papers in digital format. So agenda item one today is the decision on taking business in private. The first item on the agenda is to consider whether to take item five on consideration of the committee's work programme in private later this morning. Are we agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation. And this item is regarding five negative instruments as listed on the agenda. Reservoir Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-90. Reservoirs, uh, panels of reservoir engineers, sections under which members may be appointed. Scotland Order 2015 SSI 2015-92. Uh, waste Recycle it Quality Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-101. The Alien and Locally Absent Species in Aquaculture Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-103. And the Crofting Counties Agricultural Grant Scotland Variation Scheme 2015 SSI 2015-105. Two of these instruments have been drawn to the committee's attention by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. The first is the Reservoir Scotland Regulations 2015 SSI 2015-90, which has been drawn to the committee's attention under Reporting Ground H, as the meaning of Regulations 10 and 17 could be clearer, and under the general group, as there is a drafting error in Regulation 8. In its report, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee noted that the government had agreed to address the matters reported in relation to Regulations 8 and 10 at the next opportunity, and that the committee suggested the government um, uh, consider clarifying the drafting of Regulation 17 brackets 2 at the same time. The second instrument which has been drawn to our attention is the Crofting Counties Agricultural Grant Scotland Variation Scheme 2015 SSI 2015-105. Again, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committees drawn to our attention the general reporting ground as there is a minor drafting error. Scottish Government's agreed to correct this drafting error at the next opportunity. I refer members to the paper. Do, uh, does anyone have any comments? Sarah Boyack. Thank you, Convener. Yes, I, I think um, these are all welcome statutory instruments, um, and particularly given we've been discussing biodiversity, and one of them is on um, alien species. So I think it's very good to see that coming forward in the waste recycle one as well. Um, but it's the point you make there that we've had to note um, one or two errors in them, and previously on cap reform there was an error. And I would normally suggest we write to the Minister, but given that the Minister is in the room, the fact that we just note these errors, I think it would be just useful to get um, that comment made that we've picked these up and they're on the record. And there's been a few technical errors. There's not a policy problem with these, but there's technical errors, I think. Um, it's a pity you've ha we've had to have these drawn to our attention. Thanks very much. Uh, well, indeed, uh, they have been. And uh, I suppose there are different sections of the Minister's responsibilities who... Uh, deal with each of these areas. So um, I think the point's well made. Anyone else want to comment? Yeah, just, yep. Just add to that, because yep. while I, I agree they don't have any great overall policy implications, um, the, 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 the issue that was brought to our attention by NFUS on the cap reform one would have had very serious practical implications um, had, it, had it not been picked up. So uh, I just want to re reinforce what uh, Ms. Boyack has asked for. Thank you. Um, so are we agreed that we don't want to wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? We are agreed. Thank you. So we move to agenda item three, uh, which is a review of agricultural holdings legislation final report. And uh, we're joined today by uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and the Environment and members of the review group. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Lockhead. Good morning. Uh, with Andrew Thin and Hamish Lean. Good morning to you. Uh, do you wish to make any opening remarks, uh, Richard? 
Uh, yes, thank you very much, convener. I'll just say a few remarks uh, to open because we're very pleased to be here. I'm clearly joined by Andrew Thin and Hamish Lean from the review group. Ian Mackay was hoping to be here, but I understand some transport problems <laughs> getting off of the uh, island of Mull. Uh, and <coughs> Other members are unfortunately ill today, so I'm pleased, though, that we have uh, two members of the review group here to help me answer some of the, the questions from the committee today, because a lot of really good work was put in over the duration of the, of the inquiry. And Andrew and Hamish and their colleagues travelled the length and breadth of Scotland and spoke to literally hundreds of tenant farmers and landowners and others with an interest in the, the future of tenant farming in Scotland. So we're very proud of rep reports. We clearly believe our, our recommendations point a way forward to creating and protecting a vibrant tenancy sector uh, in Scotland, which is so important for the future of agriculture and particularly for giving opportunities to new entrants to enter the industry and get onto the first rung of the ladder and often securing a tenancy is the, the best way to do that. So we do believe the recommendations are the right way forward and we'll look forward to answering your questions today. I should say there were three broad aims of the inquiry and recommendations, firstly to promote productive relationships between tenants and landlords, secondly to enable older tenant farmers to retire with dignity, which in turn would help facilitate uh, new entrants being able to get into the industry, and thirdly to provide letting vehicles and a structure for the sector, which of course is fit for purpose in the 21st century. No doubt you'll be asking questions on various recommendations and the rationale behind them, and we look forward to that discussion. I should say that in terms of one particular recommendation to create a tenant farming commissioner, the industry, of course, were making the case to me that whilst we await the legislation to be put in place, it would be helpful to have had a kind of interim farming commissioner put in place. So what we are announcing today is that we're going to appoint an independent advisor to work with the industry uh, in the interim whilst we await the actual legislation to establish a tenant farming commissioner. And that independent advisor will work with all sectors involved in tenant farming. And the idea will be to continue the constructive working relationships that have been built up over the last few years, and particularly during the, the inquiry. Clearly, the industry are keen that we don't lose the momentum of that working together and constructive approach, which has perhaps been lacking in past years, but finally appears to be working to a degree. Uh, so hopefully the independent advisor, once appointed, we'll be able to keep up the momentum and work across all the sectors and, and make sure we're all pointing in the same direction. So it's just to confirm that we're making that announcement today. And in terms of taking the legislation forward, I, I should of course point out that it's our intention at this stage to use the Land Reform Bill as a vehicle for the agricultural holdings legislation. Clearly, there's a, a range of recommendations. Some will require legislation, some will not require legislation. Uh, but clearly that's the most obvious vehicle for us to use and that at this stage is our intention. But the government will make more announcements in due course in terms of the Land Reform Bill. So I can't really say too much more about the contents of the Land Reform Bill at this stage. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we've got uh, perhaps some questions to ask. Uh, welcome the appointment of an interim advisor uh, and obviously have to discuss how that would work in terms of... Uh, the sort of things that we expect uh, an interim or a, a commissioner uh, to actually do. Um, codes that the commissioner will prepare would be statutory, would they? And what remedies would the commissioner have in dealing with uh, issues that arise? Thank you. <clears throat> well, clearly, given some of the serious issues that have arisen in the tenant farming sector over recent years, We've had the inquiry, but even before that, there was a tenant farming forum, and there's been a lot more attempt to have some collaborative work across the sector, bringing landowners and landlords together with tenants and the other players in the sector to try and focus on some of the, the sore points that perhaps are preventing better relationships between landlords and tenants. So over the last few years, we've seen agreements and codes drawn up in terms of rent reviews in terms of land agents and other areas of, of um, sometimes uh, controversy within the sector. So that's been quite a new approach over the last few years and the rationale behind the Tenant Farming Commissioner was 
following the consultation and uh, the evidence taken by the inquiry, there was a desire to continue that kind of working and collaboration. And it felt that we needed a, a, a role established to take that forward and make it happen. So one of the roles clearly of a tenant farming commissioner, as outlined in the report, would be to facilitate better relationships between landlords and tenants. And part of that clearly would be looking at the codes and any future codes that would be required and best practice and so on. It would certainly be our intention that that would be underpinned by statute. So that's something I'll look seriously at in terms of the bill, is underpinning it by statute. Clearly, we have a bit more thinking to do about the detail of that as to whether it's the actual codes that are put into statute or whether the codes are not within statute but are underpinned by statute in that the law would refer to them and therefore the codes would be taken into account by any legal proceedings in the future. So that's where we are at the moment of thinking. So there will be, there will be statute underpinning as a minimum uh, and clearly the Tenant Farming Commissioner will be a new post and will keep a focus on building those relationships that are so essential to a successful and vibrant tenancy sector in Scotland. Um, you forgive us by saying that we've been through the business about having voluntary codes before and uh, the way in which we mentioned a statutory code for aquaculture didn't necessarily make it possible for us to believe that it could be easily uh, carried through and uh, interrogated because I think the aquaculture code of practice, good practice, is 147 pages, if I remember rightly. And if there are several different codes, then, you know, it would be a concern for us if there wasn't some means to uh, make sure that they dovetail and that, in fact, that they are answerable uh, to legal inter interrogation. Yes, and I want to bring colleagues in a second. I very much see this as a, this you is giving evidence to the committee today, but what I'd just add to what I've said already in response to your points is that I have said all along throughout the last two or three years in relation to this that I would not hesitate to make the codes statutory. What I've said to you a few moments ago is that clearly you can underpin codes by statute in that they're given legal recognition, or you can actually incorporate the codes into the bill. So I think the, the former is probably the most sensible way forward at this stage, but clearly we'll take a decision in due course once we publish the bill. So I can give you an assurance that there will be some form of statute underpinning uh, of the codes. Uh, but I'd like to bring in Andrew or Hamish, because I think they've, they've got strong views on this and have been obviously heavily involved in inquiry in, in this regard. I don't know if you want to say anything on the codes? Could I, could I use the, uh, the rents as, a, as an example? R very controversial area, uh, um, source of great angst. Um, Tenant Farming Forum some time ago produced uh, guidance on, the, on rent. Produced. It was only two pages, so it can be done succinctly. That was probably too succinct. Um, the industry bodies got together last year with our help, help from the review group, and they produced um, something much closer to a, a code. Even then, it was only five pages. That clearly was a voluntary industry self-regulation code. Nonetheless, it had a significant, widely acknowledged, it had a significant difference on rent review procedures last autumn. However, some people did not adhere to it, and that's the weakness. And as the Cabinet Secretary says, tackling that weakness is, is, the, is why statute will need to put some teeth behind this. Okay. Um, I think that's quite helpful. Uh, some developed points on that. Mike Russell? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the discussion we had last week on whether or not this should be statutory or not tended to indicate that the examples that we were receiving, and Andrew's just given another one in terms of, of rent, was that even with the best will in the world, and sometimes there isn't the best will in the world in this particular area, uh, there is a, a difficulty in making non-statutory codes work. Um, I think if the evidence is that strong, and it seems to be, then I hope uh, the Cabinet Secretary will not just give statutory underpinning, but make sure it has statutory force, because the Tenant Farmer Commissioner and the Code are going to be at the heart of making this legislation work. Yes, <clears throat> I hear the message loud and clear, and I, I'm sympathetic to what you're saying. Thompson. Yeah. Morning, Cabinet Secretary, and... Uh, Mr. Thin and Mr. Lean, I'm sure your contributions won't be thin and lean. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be substantial. Um, just really to follow on from the point that, that Mike Russell made there, that, uh, and, and it will depend very much just what statutory underpinning 
uh, actually looks like uh, in, in, in the bill itself. I've had lots of experience in, in, in a previous incarnation to do with statutory codes and voluntary codes. And as has been said already, the problem is the good comply and the bad ignore. And, you know, if you want these things to work, you really have to have a stick that you can use, hopefully very sparingly. But if the stick's there, then the bad will um, be forced to uh, comply. Good, decent people will always go along with, with codes. So I, I will be very interested to see exactly um, what the statutory underpinning is, because it could be as simple as, um, you know, there will be codes, and that would be statutory. Uh, or it might be much stronger than that. So um, I don't know if you wish to comment further. Well, clearly, <clears throat> we are considering how best to take this forward. And until the bill is published, I can't give you in black and white exactly what it will look like. But what I am saying is I'm very sympathetic and supportive of having statutory un underpinning as a minimum within the bill. What does that mean? Well, what that means is that the law will recognise the codes and therefore it's not simply a voluntary code which people can just think, am I going to pay attention to this or not? They will have to be very conscious that if they don't pay attention to it and there are court proceedings, eh, that will be used against them in the courts because it will have statutory underpinning. So that would give teeth to the voluntary codes, but as I said, we'll certainly take on board the committee's views. Thank you. What was on from that? So, so, you know, how will the Commissioner work with and alongside the Land Court and uh, with the potential for arbitration? Well, clearly, the concept at the moment of a Tenant Farming Commissioner is to work with the, the sector and all the players, as I said before, and bring them together, try and achieve consensus in some issues or compromise in some issues, clearly, and that will be their role. The land court, of course, is the, the legal route, and therefore there's a very distinctive difference between the two roles. Uh, the Commissioner will be just working with all the players to try and achieve collaboration to address concerns that still continue to exist within the, the industry. Alec Ferguson. Thank you, Camilla. I just Can I just follow that up a little bit? Would there not need to be some sort of interrelationship between the Commissioner and the land court? Well, again, well, given the subject matter that they're going to be looking at. Well, I'm sure the Tenant Farming Commission will have to be very um, familiar with the, the, the legislation, but in terms of the land court, clear that is a court of law. That is a different role entirely from the, the commissioner. The commissioner is a post to work with the industry, looking at issues facing the industry and to bring everyone together and try and address those issues. That clearly is not the role of the land court. The Land Court is a judicial body and therefore it's got a distinctive role. We Amy Schleen might want to come in as a, as a legal person. <laughs> Where the codes of practice might have a, a, an interaction with uh, Land Court decision making, uh, obviously if people follow a code of practice, they can still at the end of the day have a, a disagreement about the correct resolution of the problem, in which case it will have to be dealt with by the Land Court. But where one party to the dispute hasn't followed uh, a code of practice, that might be something which the Land Court would take into account, uh, for example, in respect of a decision in relation to expenses. Um, so there is likely to be a, a, a relationship or an interaction uh, in actuality. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and to uh, both of the people from the review group. It's a, a quite quick supplementary. It was just that I'd noticed that the STFA had made the suggestion of a possibility of shared offices between the commissioner um, for tenant farmers and the lands commission in view of the fact that a lot of the issues were interrelated um, with, with land reform, if that recommendation indeed went ahead. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that at this stage. Well, clearly we've not taken a decision yet and we don't even have the, the draft bill published, so we will take into account that, that view of the STFA. Um, 
there may be pros and cons, I'll have to consider them. So I'm not ruling anything out at this point. Okay. Uh, thinking about rent and rent reviews, stakeholders broadly accepted the review's proposal for adopting budgets approach for calculating rents for 1991 Act tenants. Uh, they call for worked examples to be provided to show how this would work in practice. But SAVA has said that it might lead to more disputes as assessing the productive capacity of a holding involves more subjectivity. Uh, do you, the panel uh, think, you know, what difference uh, adopting a budgets approach might mean for rents and how can productive capacity of a holding be assessed objectively? Well, clearly, well, as Andrew Thin said earlier, this is quite a controversial area of, of the tenant farming debate, is how rates are determined and set. And the review group took the view that productive capacity should be the guiding principle of, of determining rents and not open market. Uh, clearly, that's seen as fairer and more proportionate and realistic. Therefore, as you say, convener, the question is what factors should take into account, how that should be modelled, and are, are there working examples that could be put together to help give some guidance to the industry? So we're actively working on that at the moment. Officials are working on some modelling and worked examples. So we will also work with the industry to put these together. So that all I can say is that will be made available and that work is underway. So we are thinking generally that uh, questions about the market uh, are going to play much less of a part in your thinking uh, than before. Yes, and I'll bring Andrew in because he's been involved heavily in the rent side of things. We don't have a f an effective market in, in tenant farms. Um, there, there is a massive uh, over-demand under-supply, so there isn't an effective market. So if you allow the market to operate, uh, rents will go, th go well above pr productive capacity in the short term, which can't be in the public interest, I don't think. So that's the fundamental point here. If, if we take a long-term view, if this market uh, equilibrates, then one can allow market... You know, market forces are fine when markets are balanced, but they're not fine when markets are unbalanced. And that, so that's the fundamental here, and that's the, that's the grounds for uh, regulated rents uh, in, in behind it. Will, will this lead to more disputes? We have strong recommendations in the report around uh, testing and modelling and around developing model budgets and so on in order to address exactly that point. So I, I don't believe it will lead to more disputes. I think it can be modelled very well, actually. OK. Yeah. Simply to echo uh, Andrew's point, the, the basic rent review test at the moment for a secure 1991 Act test is a, a qualified open market test. But the problem with that is that, of course, there hasn't been an open market in respect of secure tenancies for at least the last 40 years, possibly longer. The productive capacity test doesn't solve all of the problems, and there will, of course, be scope for parties to disagree uh, about the productive capacity of a holding. But there are industry standard uh, measurements of production and so on which are available, uh, and uh, the process should be it more straightforward and certainly fairer than adjusting um, against uh, open market lettings for limited duration tenancies against secure tenancies, for example, which happens at the moment. Thank you for that. Um, that gives us a clear steer, I would say. Um, turn to investment improvements, compensation and, and we go. Jim Hume. Thanks very much, convener, and uh, good morning to the panel. Uh, yeah, there was a bit of a questioning uh, from some of the stakeholders as to what a value a tenancy would actually be, uh, obviously, if registered. Um, so I would be quite interested in uh, if you've actually talked with any lenders to confirm how they would value uh, and lend uh, uh, to a tenancy if uh, granted security against a tenancy. And... Uh, I would also be interested in Wigos, but I'll maybe come back to that in a su supplementary. In relation to uh, being able to take a security uh, against a, a lease, that, of course, is possible at the moment uh, in the commercial world uh, in respect of leases which are for 20 years and longer. They are capable of being registered in the land register, uh, and lenders will take security over them, uh, essentially on the basis that if they... <coughs> 
take up the tenant's interest in the lease that is then capable of being assigned on the open market for value and there is therefore a, a return on the loan made. Uh, we did meet with uh, various uh, banks and the, the Agricultural Lending Committee of the, uh, of the banks uh, and they said to us that in respect of their lending decisions, really what they're looking at first and foremost is the, the business proposition being put before them. Uh, is it actually workable? Do they think that this particular person can make it work? Uh, is it affordable? And so on. However, one of the factors when coming to a decision about making a, 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 a loan is whether or not there is security available. And that therefore one of the aspects of the decision making process would be to look at available security and if in fact it was capable of having a secure lease registered in the land register and therefore a bank taking a security over that, that may well uh, make the difference in, in some particular lending decisions. Okay, um, thanks for that. That's, that. That looks like there's been due process uh, going forward there. There's been fairly... Um, was that on that very point? Was on it? that point, Alan? Yeah, if, if, if yeah. that's possible, and yes. Then, I, I, do you yeah. mind? I'm sorry. Thank you for, thank you for allowing me in. Um, can I just... Mr Lean mentioned um, t 20 years. I, is there any evidence to show that uh, a longer security gives greater borrowing capacity, if I can put it that way? There's... Well, we certainly didn't hear evidence about that, although, in fairness, we didn't ask the bankers about that. Um, there would be no reason to think that the length of the lease, if it was capable of being secured, would have a factor because, of course, what the bank is looking at is stepping into the tenant's shoes if he defaults or he or she defaults on the loan and then disposing of the lease for value in order to uh, recover their lending. So from that perspective, the length of the lease uh, isn't really material. Security rather than the length yes. that, that is the, the factor. But of course, the value of that lease uh, on the open market to somebody who was interested in buying it from the bank, that the value would reflect the unexpired uh, duration of the lease. Now, if a secure tenancy was registered in the land register, uh, then of course we are proposing that that is capable of being converted into a 35-year LDT and assigned on the open market. So a bank calling up a security on a secure tenancy would go through the conversion process and then, as it were, sell the resulting 35-year LDT. Yeah, I think well, is the that's what we've... Well, we have proposed a 35-year conversion, yes. Yes, I'll come back to that later, probably. But thank you very much. That's really useful. Thank you. Back to Jim. Thank, th 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 thanks very much. No, 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 that was, uh, that was uh, very useful. Uh, it's just regarding Wagos and uh, the proposed uh, three-year amnesty. There's been fairly broad support for that. Uh, there was, uh, I think, one organisation wanted it just to be a one-year amnesty. Um, I just wonder why we have to limit that to a three-year amnesty. I mean, if somebody's made an improvement, uh, why can that not be registered at, uh, at any point in the future? Because I'm thinking in the future of perhaps when um, there, are, there are improvements that are not and should have been uh, registered for legal purposes. What we identified was a, a, a historical problem, really, uh, in that... Uh, in years past, tenants haven't always been aware uh, of the, the formal notification procedures in respect of improvements. Uh, and that on occasion, uh, it's the case when a tenancy comes uh, to an end that a, a particular improvement, which still has value, uh, isn't compensated because the proper notification procedures haven't been carried through. Um, that's much less common because tenants tend to be more aware uh, of the need to go through formal procedures. Um, but we felt that in the interest of fairness across the whole industry, looking at both the, the, the landlord and the tenant's perspective, that an amnesty period uh, would be suitable for everybody bringing their affairs up to date, as it were, uh, and there would be a clear process and a window of opportunity. Now, of course, there may be tenants out there um, who don't take up the opportunity and at some stage in the future uh, carry out an improvement without proper notification, and that may result in a problem in the future. But uh, it's, it's very difficult to do anything about that, uh, I think. Uh, uh, if 
if, if I may, I suppose then it's up to government to, in some respects to make sure and ensure that uh, tenants, etc., are aware that they have to register for, for the future. So I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary would recognise that and, and take that on board to um, ensure that tenant farmers that perhaps are not members of organisations like NFUS or STFA are actually uh, educated about uh, their rights. Yes, I mean, I'll take that point away and we, we always are trying to think of new ways of doing that because that applies to all aspects of the, the legislation, not just this particular area of policy. So we'll yeah. take that point away. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we'll be talking about, uh, you know, alternative letting vehicles a little later on. But uh, there's a couple of points that we need to make on this. First of all, Graeme Day. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, gentlemen. Just because it's possible to borrow in principle doesn't mean that will happen in reality. I mean, you know, many owner farmers have great difficulty getting funds from banks. From the discussions you've had, how confident are you that in reality banks will take a positive view in this regard? What the bank said to us um, is that it would simply be one of several factors which they would take into account in their lending decision. Um, if banks aren't lending for a variety of reasons, um, with or without security, then the fact that a secure tenant can offer up the lease of security probably won't help. But it would be more helpful than the situation which exists at the moment. Uh, the banks weren't telling us that this was a magic bullet to lending decisions, uh, but they also made clear to us that they did lend to tenants. Um, and primarily what they looked at was the, the business case for the particular uh, borrowing which was being sought. Was it realistic? Could it be achieved? Was it affordable? Right, thank you. Alec Ferguson. I'm, I'm sorry to keep uh, coming back in, Kavina, but I think there's a, there's a really important point here. I'm, I'm aware that I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to stray into the next topic of questioning, but we, it was put to us quite strongly last week that uh, open assignations would massively increase the ability of tenants to borrow. Did you find any evidence to state to, to back that up may I ask uh, I think the short answer to that is no uh, although again in fairness it wasn't a, uh, a question I think that we put directly to to bankers I think we'll pursue that just in a minute or two but in terms of Wago uh, the STFA have uh, suggested a two-stage approach to this uh, where firstly, and because at the moment a tenant has to serve an irreversible notice to quit before reaching agreement over Wago, I understand that to be the case. Um, and they're saying, well, firstly, a notice of intention to quit served by the tenant one year in advance, subject to compensation being reached six months before the end of the tenancy. And secondly, confirmation of notice to quit following agreement of Wago compensation and vacation uh, of the holding following payment of that compensation. Uh, have you had any thoughts about that process to make WAGO more practical? Well, I, I can probably pick that up. Um, on one view, that's unnecessary. Uh, it's within the tenant's gift to serve a, a notice of intention to remove. Once served, of course, it's it's irretrievable. Um, the tenant is then bound to vacate the holding. Uh, but there's nothing at the moment which would prevent the tenant approaching the landlord and saying, if I serve a, a notice of intention to remove against a particular termination date, um, what will you pay me in terms of way going and compensation? Uh, and the parties can then work to an agreement and the tenant uh, has a figure which is acceptable or isn't acceptable. So probably there's no need for such a, a technical process because it's something which could happen at the moment and in fact does happen from time to time. Thank you. Do you have any other points, Jim? So, okay. Well, let's move on to retirement succession and assignation. Uh, Mike Russell, the lead. There was obviously a considerable discussion last week uh, regarding uh, the issue of assignation and a particularly strong uh, contribution from Scottish Land and Estates who uh, said that the Cabinet Secretary would be liable for £600 million the moment this was brought into any legislation. I I'd be interested in the views of the 
panel on that, particularly those who've um, been through this process over a period of time. But I want to particularly focus on a question to the Cabinet Secretary. I raised last week the 1948 bill. And the 1948 bill that essentially allowed open or free assignation uh, was a bill which result, took place because of the imperative that the government at the time, the UK government at the time, had for growing more food. And I think that illustrates quite starkly that the issue of what the length of assignation could be, the type of assignation that takes place, is above all a product of the national policy on farming. It's not really a matter for technical discussion between experts, and that's really what it was beginning to become. So I'd really like to know from the Cabinet Secretary what his policy is towards farming, how that is fulfilled by the tenant farming sector, and therefore, in his view, what the right level of assignation should be, whether it lies, as many of us think, much more closely to the 1948 model, or whether it lies in the more restrictive model that has developed since then. The, the changes in the 1950s came about because of a restriction that landlords wished to see placed on that open assignation. And I think that political intention should then guide uh, whatever the legislation does rather than a technical discussion. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude about lawyers, but a technical discussion between lawyers or experts on land holding. OK, well, thank you. And the, I should assure you, your Cabinet Secretary is broke just now and can't afford £600 million. Pounds, uh, so <coughs> we'll perhaps return to that subject uh, later on. In terms of your question about how th this inquiry, this report, the recommendations fit into our vision for agriculture in Scotland, it's a good question. I'll try and answer it relatively succinctly. But what I would say at the outset is that in terms of government policy, in terms of my policy, it's vitally important we have active agriculture in this country and we maintain the ability to produce food for our people. To do that, we have to ensure our land is productive and we have people to work the land. And essentially, that's a vision that we have to realise. So in terms of the role the tenancy sector fits into the vision for Scottish agriculture, well, clearly, as I said at the outset, the aims of these reforms are to ensure that our land has been used productively and that we have people who are able to enter agriculture, choose a career in agriculture, to maintain the skills in this country to produce food. And therefore, ensuring tenancies are available as a first rung on the ladder for new entrants and for people who want to farm the land, who clearly don't have several million pounds in the bank to buy land, is very, very important to, to help take the vision forward. Assignations and the way in which we've approached that with our recommendations um, are clearly designed to keep land in tenancies. In other words, for instance, if there is a 1991 tenancy, a secure tenancy, and there is a danger that the land will be lost to tenancy because of a lack of successor, for instance, then clearly we're making some proposals that will keep that land in the tenancy sector, bringing the benefits I've just described. Not only that, the open assignation of the tenancies will allow perhaps older farmers to retire with dignity as we all know, one feature of the tenancy debate in Scotland for, for a long, long time, long before I've been in, in post, is that it's sometimes difficult for older farmers to retire and make way for the next generation, and that can act as a bit of a blockage. Now, clearly, if there's a way in which the older farmer is able to vacate the tenancy and receive some return that allows a dignified retirement or to move on to the next stage of their life, then that opens up opportunities for others and allows that dignified retiring from farming. So that fluid um, and flexible working of the tenancy system is very important to the future of agriculture in Scotland. The 1948 bill, um, as Michael Russell quite rightly says, I wish Sir Crispin Agnew was here, one of the review group members, who's an expert on that bill, but I'm sure my colleagues are as well, of course was out of the post-war situation in Scotland to make sure our land was uh, used for growing food and sometimes you know, we have to take radical steps to ensure that's the case. I believe there are radical steps within this, this uh, report that will help ensure that's the case. But I should, of course, point to other Scottish government policies that are important in the regard of the, the agricultural vision. So, for instance, as Michael Russell and others are aware, we are looking for opportunities to use publicly owned land to open up opportunities for food production and uh, new tenancies to help new entrants get their opportunity. 
So this is not just about this bill. The vision clearly is about using our land and using other areas of policy to deliver that. Just pursue that for a moment. Yes. I think what you're saying, I you know, very much agree with. The result of a restriction, any restriction and assignations from where we are, uh, and conversely, therefore, uh, a benefit from being more flexible of assignations, um, is, are pretty clear. If you restrict assignations, you're likely to, almost inevitably to reduce the numbers of people who are actively farming. You're going to increase the centralised power of a smaller number of, of owners. You may well influence the market, and it's interesting Andrew's view on the lack of market in tenancies. You may inf influence the overall market and include the food market because price controls will come from fewer people. But there's another link I, I want you just to, to, to see if you will comment on, which is the link to community empowerment. Certainly in the areas I represent, the availability of a tenant farms and a larger number of people active in ag agriculture uh, has a strong community benefit. It is good for the community. And indeed, if there are fewer people involved in active participation in farming or working on the land, the community is then weakened. So presumably when we come on to the question of uh, intervention in w where intervention may be necessary in terms of failing landlordism, you would recognize there and will recognize here the link to assignation as a positive community benefit. Absolutely, and it's a very good point to make. And the reason why it's a very good point to make clearly is if we have a situation, be it in Mr. Russell's constituency or anyone else's constituency, where we have, for sake of argument, an elderly relative wishing to retire from the farm who has a keen nephew or grandson or whoever who's keen to take over the farm and therefore it means the next generation in that community can continue to have a job locally, make their living locally, continue the way of life in agriculture, then we should make that opportunity available. So it's very much a community empowerment issue and for the health of our, of our communities in Scotland. Therefore we would be campaigning under the slogan back to 1948. Back to the future. So Andrew Thin, I think, wanted to comment on it too. Yeah. Could I just follow through? Yeah, but then we've got several MSPs yeah, sorry, with supplementaries. That's fine. We have undersupply in the market. We have insufficient land coming forward, for, uh, tenanted land coming forward. We have one of the lowest proportions of farmland in tenancy in Europe. So, so we have to do two things, and the review group was focused on achieving two things against this. One, we have to protect the current supply point you're making about assignation. Two, we have to stimulate and build confidence in order to stimulate additional new supply. And those two, those two go together, they're very important. So to protect current supply, we suggested widening succession, which will in fact protect most supply. And for those who don't have a successor, we suggested a conversion in our 35 years. So current supply is effectively protected under these recommendations for 35 years. That's the effect of it. At the same time, we've sought to build confidence in the land earning sector that if they let, there will still be sufficiently flexible flexibility there to enable them to restructure and so on over time into the future. And I think if, were we to follow the crofting model, which you'd be very familiar with, of open assignation and effectively compulsory letting of, of land, uh, we felt that that would undermine confidence and would make it would make it very difficult to stimulate the new supply. So there's a balance going on here between protection and stimulation. Uh, in that case, Dave Thompson first. Thank you very much, convener. And just really to follow on from the point touched on there by uh, Andrew Thin, um, the 600 million that was referred to by Mike Russell uh, was in relation to um, the LDTs. Uh, indeed, I, I think what SLE said was that if open market assignation um, was uh, imposed, it would cost 1.78 billion, which is an astronomical um, sum. Um, and I can't see where the detriment is. There might be minor detriment in a landlord transferring from one secure tenant to another secure tenant, because in essence, their position doesn't change. <clears throat> so I just don't see where 1.78 billion would come from in relation to this. Maybe one way forward uh, in terms of open assignations, and, and you did mention, uh, Cabinet Secretary, a few moments ago, open assignations. Um, 
One way would be to limit open assignations to new entrants, and that would therefore limit the effect that Andrew Thin mentioned, and it would also allow new entrants to come in uh, to the system. So I just wonder if the panel would comment on these two things. Just what were you meaning by open assignation, and would having open assignation, full open assignation, but limited to new entrants, uh, how would that affect things? <clears throat> well, first of all, your cabinet secretary is too broke to afford 600 million. He's certainly too broke to afford 1.78 billion. Uh, so, <clears throat> the less silly reports we have uh, like that, the uh, more constructive and helpful will be moving this debate forward. Because I think that uh, whole intervention at the time when we are supposed to be saying there's unprecedented collaboration and understanding of some of the key issues facing tenant farming, uh, I think you know these figures and that report and its timing. It was unconstructive and unhelpful. Um, and given that we've not even published the legislation yet by which you could even begin to remotely work out any potential figures if you had one strong view on one side of the debate, it escapes me how they can um, come up with these figures. So <clears throat> you do raise a good point in terms of what it would mean having open assignations and for new entrants. We did discuss this as a group, and I don't pretend we have the answers, but it's something we're thinking about in terms of moving forward the legislation, because you are quite right. It would be preferable if new entrants had a good opportunity to secure these opportunities. So if a tenancy is made available on the market and the new entrant is able to secure that, clearly that would be beneficial for agriculture. So we're giving that some thought, uh, and we don't want people simply snapping up every single tenancy that becomes available, and then there's even more consolidation. Uh, and I'm not sure there's an easy fix to that, but certainly something we're thinking about. Okay, thank you. Thank Andrew. <coughs> What's going Can I come forward? on? First of all, we think we've made the public interest case clearly in the report for, for these changes. Um, so, uh, I, 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 and I don't actually think that Scottish Land and States is arguing with the, the, the public interest case, so far as I understand it. What they're saying is that somehow there will be a loss of value for which compensation would have to be paid. Were that to be the case, you would expect land values to have fallen on publication of this report. I haven't seen any evidence of that. So I think you have to take this advice with a, a significant pinch of salt and let the government's law officers consider the thing thoroughly, and I, I would strongly advise that. Um, on the issue about limiting assignation, um, we thought really hard about this. It's a really important point that Mr. Thompson is making. Um, it is actually very difficult to define a new entrant and therefore quite difficult in law to start doing this. And it also, of course, potentially limits the value that the outgoer would obtain. If you constrain the market, you constrain the value the outgoer would get and therefore fewer would, would want to retire because the market would have been constrained artificially. What I think could be done here is that the commissioner could put in place a code of practice that governed how, the, how, how these assignations were conducted in order to ensure a process that increased the likelihood of that, that entirely justifiable public interest outcome occurring, but done so in a, manage, in, in a managed way. I think that could be done without having to go to statute and saying only new entrants can have these things. Chairman, um, I think it might be helpful for the committee to understand uh, the group's reasoning behind this particular proposal, uh, bearing in mind, of course, that we have recommended uh, widening the eligible class of family members who are entitled either to uh, inherit or have a, a secure tenancy assigned to them. Bearing that in mind, the, the question of assignation to a third party we saw primarily as a means of motivating a, an elderly tenant who wasn't farming a unit uh, efficiently, but who didn't have an eligible successor, even under our new proposals, to be able to convert that uh, tenancy interest into something of value, which would allow that tenant to retire and have a more efficient person take that tenancy on. Um, we saw the, that likely person taking on the tenancy, probably not really a new entrant, but probably somebody who was at the second rung of the tenancy ladder. So somebody perhaps who's coming to the end of a 10-year limited duration tenancy, 
who has acquired capital expertise, perhaps a general partner and a limited partnership tenancy who's coming to an end uh, in similar circumstances, they will now have uh, an opportunity uh, to move into another form of tenancy uh, and will be able to afford the value uh, which will incentivise the assigning tenant actually to convert, uh, assign, sell and retire and have something uh, on, on, upon which to, to, to retire. Um, the question of whether the, the assignation should be like for like, secure tenancy to su secure tenancy, or there should be a conversion process, we discussed at length within the group, but really for the, the public policy reasons which Andrew's uh, already uh, explained, we, we came to the view that uh, that we could support uh, assignation on conversion. Yeah, yeah, that thank, thank you. That, that, that's very helpful, convener. Uh, just a couple of little points in there that I'd like to follow up on. I think I read somewhere, and I can't find it just in front of me just now, that around 30% um, of um, tenancies would be in the position where they wouldn't have uh, one of the, the new um, uh, criteria, you know, the, the parents and living descendants, etc. That's quite a lot. Um, and you, you have sort of answered up to a point the reason for converting into LDTs, but, but the combination of these th two things would lead to a further lessening of tenancies overall. Uh, am I right in saying that? I don't think that is right, Mr Thompson, because yeah. um, the Conversion and then assignation doesn't result in the loss of a tenancy. It results in a conversion from a 1991 Act tenancy to a 35-year um, tenancy. Uh, and it would only be if, at the end of that 35-year tenancy, that the land wasn't further let out, that there would be a loss. But there is certainly no immediate loss. And if uh, the proposals contained within the report are successful, then there will be a, a regular supply of land available for let uh, coming to the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you've confirmed the point. There would be a, a long-term loss, potentially. Um, potentially, but not yeah. if our proposals are successful, as, as we hope they will be. Okay, thanks. Jack, and then uh, Graham Day, and then Alec Ferguson. Thank you very much, Convener. I think it's really useful to tease behind the recommendations of the review in this point because there's two public policy issues, isn't there? One is about the capacity for people who are currently tenant farmers to make their decision about when they want to stop being tenant farmers. And there's the point of those who are kind of mid-career tenants who've got the 1991 tenancies. Um, and it's about how they leave farming, at what point they leave farming, and what value have they built up that they can take with them. And then there's what influence do they have over who comes after them and how do they work with the person that comes after them. And there might be a crossover point as well, so it's not, it's not necessarily a, a cut-off point. So I think it's quite important to tease these out. Um, and the other issue I was interested in is Recommendation 16, where you talk about the need for national and local planning policies on retirement options in terms of housing for farmers who are retiring because it, it's stating the obvious for many tenant farmers, the farm is their home. So you're not just talking about leaving your paid employment that you have built up your value in, but you're also talking about seeking a new home. And I think making sure you've thought through all of those issues is actually quite important. And I would have thought recommendation 16 is both really important, but actually quite difficult to deliver because you're talking about a relatively small number of people in a given area who might have actually quite distinct needs. So I think following that through is, is actually quite a challenging recommendation. Yes, and you've pinpointed some important issues, and that is, of course, why the, the, the review group did highlight the issue over planning policy and giving the opportunity for any retiring farmers to, to have their own home. Delivering that, of course, uh, no doubt it will be challenging. I recall writing to all local authorities a few years ago, asking them all to be sympathetic towards uh, retiring farmers in terms of their planning policy for, for homes on the farm. Uh, and, of course, sometimes that does happen. I've, I've visited many elderly farmers who now live in a house and their, their sons or daughters are now farming uh, uh, the, the land and, and living in the main farmhouse. 
So we will continue to look at ways of making that a reality and easier to happen. Uh, so that's a case of planning policy, both in terms of national guidance, but also in terms of recruiting the support of Scotland's local authorities. It's in their interest as well that we, we hopefully support that. Presumption in favour of being able to build houses where there is a ruin. Um, in wider planning policy, there are, just from personal experience, I happen to know that local authorities do pursue that. I'm not, I can't speak for all local authorities, but certainly some do that. If that's the case, you know, it, you would think it would be easier for many uh, an estate or a landowner to be able to provide a site for the very kind of house that uh, Sarah Boyack was talking about. Oh. Yes? Also, in my experience, I think it varies from local authority to local authority quite a lot. Okay. Well, that should be interesting. Mm -hmm for us to pursue. Uh, Graham Day. Thank you, Kavira. A couple of questions, really. Um, it, first one is, is how you can achieve all that you uh, indicated to Mike Russell you're trying to achieve in your original answer, whilst adequately safeguarding the reasonable rights of landowners. I'm thinking of a question that arose last week where there was some doubt raised as to whether the grounds for objection by the landlord uh, of uh, suitability in terms of character, ability and financial resource, whether that will be maintained. And my second question as well is, in, you know, you've, you've weighed out what you're trying to achieve with assignation, but how will you uh, avoid a situation where perhaps a merchant banker comes along purchasing the... Um, the expertise uh, of an advisor, so they have the money, they have the ex apparent expertise, to stop them snapping up and assign tenancy, which is clearly what you wouldn't want to happen. Well, first of all, uh, in respect of the qualifications of the successor or the assignee, um, what we envisage is that the existing uh, tests, which have to do with skills and experience and financial resources uh, and character grounds to, to a certain extent, that those all remain in place. Um, uh, and those, uh, in the merchant banker situation that you describe, it would be the merchant banker personally who would have to demonstrate that he had the skills and experience, um, albeit he might ultimately want to delegate them. Um, so the, it's a, that would prevent, uh, I think, the sort of situation which, which you've described arising. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Clears it up. Any other points on this just now? No? Okay. Well, thinking about the role of right to buy, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener. Uh, there was quite a lot of discussion on this with stakeholders um, in our session last week. And I wonder if, um, Cabinet Secretary, you could clarify, in, first of all, in relation to the requirement for tenants to register their interests before they could exercise the right to buy, um, whether you have um, formed a, a view on that uh, yet. Well, we have accepted the recommendation that the, there should be an automatic, an automatic statutory preemptive right to buy, as opposed to having to proactively register. So, therefore, that is a recommendation, and you know I've accepted that recommendation. Right. Thank you. And uh, could you say something, perhaps, about the implications of the proposals on widening, widening assignation and succession? Um, and in relation to what effect they might have on the valuation process under the preemptive right to buy, if there was a preemptive right to buy, and, the, and whether how that would alter the valuation process. Well, I'm not sure there'll be a, a direct relationship between the valuation and the preemptive right to buy. I mean, clearly, we've I think explored at some length the the rationale behind widening assignation and the potential family members who can be successors and you know, I think we've outlined the reasons for that uh, but I don't see any direct correlation I'll, I'll look to colleagues here in case anything came up in the, the report on that. No I, it's, it's hard to see how that would impact on the, on, on the valuation. And could you say something about the trigger points for the preemptive right to buy uh, in relation to um, the uh, the landlord failing to meet their obligations and the possibility of going to the land court and also um, the ministerial intervention and how that would work with um, tenant f in the tenant farming context. Uh, right, well, clear there's two issues you mentioned there in one sentence. Uh, one's a preemptive right to buy and then one's the, the enforced sale. 
so I think you were just maybe conflating two, two separate recommendations. So, <clears throat> firstly, in terms of the preemptive right to buy, I've explained we have removed the need to register for the right to buy preemptively in that it will be automatic. Uh, and also, you asked, I think, the same sentence about triggering the preemptive right to buy, and during the evidence, you know, issues were brought to our attention that perhaps the, the triggers had to be looked at as to what triggers the preemptive right to buy. And uh, we have therefore got a recommendation in the report to to widen the triggers for the preemptive right to buy, because clearly there could be circumstances. And I'm trying to th recall the exact one we used in the report, uh, where the transfer of some or all the shares of a company uh, clearly, in effect, that could be a trigger for the preemptive right to buy, because it's a substantial change in the ownership of the the farm, so it's like putting on the market. So therefore we have a recommendation to look at that and again we are sympathetic to that. We'll have to wait for the draft bill but in terms of widening the triggers for the preemptive right to buy that's one circumstance that the report highlighted. Okay, so I've got answered Sorry. three points. So the third point uh, you were asking about of course was um, the, the, the review group clearly took the position uh, not to support the absolute right to buy because of the public policy issues that Andrew laid out um, a short while ago in terms of maintaining confidence in the letting sector because we have to have a flow of let land in Scotland, again for the reasons outlined before, to give opportunities for, for new entrants and because it is a, it's a key sector of Scottish agriculture. However, <clears throat> there were very clearly cases brought to the group's attention around Scotland where the current arrangements do not work and are not in the public interest. And in those cases, we took the view that there should be the ability of the tenant to enforce the sale of the tenancy of the farm where the landlord is not meeting their obligations. So therefore, as I think I said in the Chamber, we have a situation now where we're bringing forward a radical proposal which I believe will address a situation where good landlords, and there are many good landlords in Scotland and many good relationships between landlords and tenants, perhaps the vast majority are good and working well, have nothing to fear. But bad landlords who are not fulfilling their obligations now know that the tenant has been empowered to take steps to enforce the sale of the tenancy in the farm. And we think that's a proportionate and sensible way forward that's certainly in the public interest and certainly make sure the land has been used properly and the tenants been treated with respect and of course it's, it's, uh, it's healthy for the future of tenant farming in Scotland or Scottish agriculture more widely where there's an enforced sale to take the land out of tenancy but allow it to be farmed properly. Right, and there's just one um, final supplementary point I've got in <coughs> relation, um, Cabinet Secretary, to Minister's right to intervene um, when they're addressing barriers to local sustainable development. Um, would there be any concerns that you would have about compensation issues in relation to that? Well, clearly there's a second route for addressing obstacles to sustainable development for land being used properly in Scotland, and that is through the Land Reform Bill itself and through the Land Reform legislation. And as you know, and whilst this is not what exactly the review group we're discussing today looked at, but it did refer to it uh, as an important route. Uh, we are proposing as a government to introduce the right for uh, ministers to intervene on the basis of promoting sustainable development in terms of land ownership. So therefore, in some situations in Scotland, and I know the, the committee is aware of some situations, perhaps in Butte or Isle or elsewhere in the, the country that were highlighted to the review group during our evidence sessions, where there are community issues perhaps that could be addressed which would be to the benefit of the tenant farmers that live there. So effectively there may be a community solution where the community effectively is a group of tenant farmers. Therefore that is one route to empowering tenant farmers where there's clearly obstacles to sustainable development. All right, thank you. Mike Russell. There's a sort of matrix of legislation building up here. You've got the land reform legislation, you've got the community empowerment legislation and this controversial but I'm sure soluble issue of abandoned neglected land um, and you have the, the issue of tenancy and agricultural tenancy reform. 
just to be entirely clear, and this is important to a number of my constituents in a number of different places, you are committed to the issue of ministerial intervention in terms of agricultural tenancies uh, in circumstances where there is a community impact uh, on a small or fragile community? Yes, in terms of the community routes, which would benefit the tenant farmers in question. And clearly, as you quite rightly say, there's a programme of land reform and community impairment underway at Scottish Government level. In the case of this review we're discussing today into the tenancy sector, there are measures we've just been discussing that empower tenant farmers through land reform legislation. There are powers that empower communities. And clearly, the Community Empowerment Bill also has a range of measures to empower communities in different ways as well. We must be careful, however, that <coughs> this very important issue does not fall between three different stools. Uh, and I just want to press you a little on this. Oh, sorry, I should have just added there, then, in that case, that in terms of land reform legislation, of course, it empowers ministers as well as the communities and tenant farmers being empowered through this legislation. Yeah, indeed. And, you know, there are circumstances, quite clear circumstances, and Claudia Beamish has, has pressed you on these, I think, rightly, uh, where the failure of an individual landlord uh, over a period of time may trigger the purchase. And I think that's entirely right, and you know, there's, there should be no charter for bad landlords. But there's a wider role of landlords within small and fragile communities. Island communities are, are clearly obvious, but there are other communities. And I just want to be assured, because I know my constituents will want to be assured, that in these circumstances, the right of ministerial intervention will be guaranteed in that community. And I'd like to just be clear where that, le where that will be in legislation. Will it come in this legislation? Will it come in the land reform legislation? Will it be, uh, well, the community and parliament legislation is going to its third stage, so it's a little late for it to be uh, specifically focused on this. Precisely where will this be? Because I don't want us to come to the end of this process and find that somebody says, oh, we thought it was in some other piece of legislation. Okay. So a bad landlord will now have to be aware that in light of the will of Parliament that still has to be expressed with the legislation brought forward in due course, that tenant farmers individually will be empowered through the agricultural holdings legislation, notwithstanding Parliament's views and the actual legislation once it's brought forward, uh, to take action. And through the land reform legislation, also part of the proposed land reform bill, but still to be presented to Parliament, we are saying we are committed to powers to intervene on behalf of the community and therefore the landlords will be aware that there are several routes by which either ministers or tenant farmers can take action to empower themselves and overcome the situations which we want to rectify in our society. And one of the triggers in the land reform bill for community action would be the failure of a landlord in terms of tenancies, more than one tenancy, presumably, in fragile communities. I, I just want to be absolutely clear about that, because it could be that, you know, a community might not see itself as being empowered to act alongside tenant farmers. And I just want to be absolutely clear that that's in your mind, as the begetter of this legislation, that that will be a trigger for action. Well, as you'll be... Fully aware, all I can say at this moment is that, yes, that is a potential scenario. I cannot commit because we have not presented to Parliament the land reform legislation and this committee, will, of course, will have a, a role in scrutinising that legislation once it comes forward. But at this stage, what I can assure you is these are potential scenarios that could be addressed by the proposed legislation. I am fully familiar with ministerial caution and I am satisfied with the gleam in your eye, at least. Thank you. Alec Fergus and then Sarah Boyack. Yeah, just very briefly, I mean, uh, th th there will inevitably be scenarios under the, the sort of situations you've just been describing, whereby a land manager or owner um, will have a different view of the way that land is being managed to the community. And the community might well say, this is inappropriate, we wish to ministerial intervention so that we can take it over, where the land owner or manager is saying, well, it's perfectly reasonable. What, what sort of arbitration process do you envisage in all this? Well, you know, forgive me, you'll have to wait for the draft bill to be presented to Parliament, and that's a... a, a do, do you envisage an arbitration process that will be clarified later on? Well, clearly, the, any legislation will, will lay out the process and it is capable of being challenged. Therefore, it, you know, you're, you're, you're asking 
me to dream up hypothetical situations, but I, I, what I'm saying is that, of course, there will be an ability to challenge because the legislation will have to lay out the grounds by which action can be taken. And therefore, ultimately, it's up for the courts to, to interpret that uh, in due course. Um, okay. So you'll have to wait the legislation. Thank you. Sarah Pollyhack. Much convener, but equally, we are trying to tease out the direction of travel in terms of the policy intention, because it does go back to the point that uh, Andrew Finn made earlier about different ownership patterns and about a much higher proportion of tenanted farmers um, in other countries. And it's just thinking through if this is a new policy objective and a direction of travel, just thinking through how that all joins up. And as Mike Russell said, which bit of legislation whether there's arbitration opportunities and you know, coming back from the dairy farming discussions yesterday about issues about cooperation between farms and about producers having power. So actually it's quite important in terms of what kind of farming and what policy approach we think is important for farming um, moving forward in, you know, into the next 30, 40 years. Well, clearly, I think that goes back to some of the comments perhaps I made to, during my answer to Michael Russell's question about the vision for Scottish agriculture. And Scotland is a country blessed with fantastic fertile land and it's the national interest we're using that land productively and in a fair way that treats the people working on the land with respect. The land reform legislation is to ensure that our land works for the people and that the people, are, as I said before, um, are able to operate in a, a fair and just environment. So how our land is used is very central to the land reform legislation and indeed to this review and the recommendations we're discussing today. It's important our land's productive and that we have people who are able to work the land and access the land to work it. If there are obstacles to that happening, the obstacles, in our view, are therefore not in the public interest. And that's why we have uh, various measures that are being adopted through legislation in due course to give us the power to intervene or to empower the farmers or, la or tenants. Okay, I just want to ask you uh, about this point, the practicalities of uh, tenancies and owner occupancy. And I understand that uh, the government's now proposing to conduct research into the differences in investment levels between owner occupied and tenanted holdings and whether there are wider benefits of owner occupation. Uh, can you confirm that that's happening and when will we see some results from that? I, mean, I don't have that information to hand in terms of the time scale, but I'd be happy to come back to the committee to, on that. There is a, there's various streams of work underway, are quite right to, to highlight that, but if you want an exact time scale, I'd be happy to, to come back to the committee with it. Well, it'll be interesting in the uh, context of the debate about uh, you know, the land reform bill in due course, because I think it's essential to understand what it takes to invest. Thank you. Um, letting vehicles for the 21st century. Uh, thank you. Like yes, moving on to, to the proposals for letting vehicles as we move forward. Um, Cabinet Secretary has already stated earlier on that assignations are designed to, I think the phrase used was to keep land in tenancies. Um, and Andrew Finn quite rightly talked about the, the huge demand for tenanted land and the very the limited supply of it. Um, and that there was also a need in all of this to, 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 to create a balance to try to create more let land to satisfy that demand. Um, I'm also interested that I think twice at least members of the panel have referred to coming to the end of the 35 year, the proposed 35 year tenancies, whereas my understanding is that the proposal is that the 35 year tenancy should be a minimum of 35 year tenancy, not a maximum. Uh, I suspect there might be more willingness um, for people to let land to, to look at that if it was a maximum, actually, rather than a minimum, because I, uh, I, I suspect that that length of term might be a deterrent for people to let land. I'd be interested in, in, in panel members' views on that. But can I, can I just ask, in that context, uh, I, I, I've, I've always said that if we can get this right, we, we will free up land, uh, we will free up more land for, 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 for the rented market, and that has to be the aim, surely, if we are to have a truly reinvigorated tenanted sector, something that we all want. So can I just ask why you think that the proposals that you're putting forward will create that environment of, of bringing more land onto the market for rent? I'm happy to come in, but I think Andrew wants to answer the point. <coughs> 
fundamental, right at the beginning of this review, we, we identified and said very clearly, this review is about confidence among tenants and confidence amongst landowners, it's about both, and, there, and everything in the review is about confidence. So what you see set out in that, that report is, is, is an integrated package of measures, all of which at the back, a lot of detailed technical stuff, but at the back is about building confidence on both sides. I think, it, uh, and I think we believe that if, if implemented by and large, of course there's detail, but by and large as a package, um, there's nothing in there that I think landowners is like is, is, is damaging to landowners' confidence. There's everything in there about fair rents, about security of tenure. We've uh, dealt with the issue of right to buy and so on. So uh, it's not obvious to us that there's anything there that, that, that a landowner should say is, is undermining to confidence. However, tenants' confidence is also enormously important because if tenants are not confident in the system, they will campaign for, for change, rights to buy and all the rest of it, which in turn undermines landowner confidence. It's a circular process. So there is a lot in there that is also about strengthening tenants' confidence in the system, confidence that they retire with dignity, get their money out, uh, that they can, you know, they don't have to uh, be succeeded by their son if they've got a nephew, all that sort of stuff. So. I think if you look at the whole thing in the round, um, and actually I think we are hearing it actually in the, in, fr fr from the stakeholder bodies, wh while there are quibbles over detail, most of the feedback is saying, yes, this, this package is okay, this package will give us more confidence. So I think the evidence is already out there. Uh, I, I don't disagree with anything you've said, except um, the, 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 the confidence to let for th to, to, to the confidence that 35-year leases, and I accept that's only in, in, in certain circumstances, but I think, you, I mean, you talk, you talk about quib quibbles around details. I think that's one of the details that might, uh, uh, th that has the potential to undermine the confidence to let that land, which we all want. So, well, I was just going to make the point that at the moment it's a secure 1991 tenancy. Mm -hmm. But there's also so, the non-repairing, the, the full repairing lease, sorry, proposal which would also be for a minimum of 35 years. And that's an option. That's a, that would be an option available for people to choose. Why, why, why 35 years? 20, 25 years gives a... 25 years is the traditional um, meaning of, of a generation, and that seems a reasonable... And I, I just feel that that little difference... OK, you call it quibbling with details, but I do feel, and I get the impression talking to people, that that length... W w would actually give a little bit more confidence to that side of the, the well, partnership. I'll ask, I think Hamish wants to come here. Well, first of all, dealing with the, the full repairing lease of 35 years, um, what we felt was that that letting vehicle uh, involves no obligations of any sort on the landlord in relation to fixed equipment. Um, and as a result, the, the landlord can let that land uh, where the tenant has the whole of the repairing obligation but also has to provide uh, modern fixed equipment if that's necessary for the efficient um, uh, running of the holding. Uh, we say in balance that therefore the, the rent for that holding should be on a productive capacity basis, uh, which means that uh, you, you look at the lack of fixed equipment provided by the landlord. So there is fairness there, we think but also in fairness to the tenant who is taking on a, a very badly uh, equipped holding or even a holding which is not equipped at all, there has to be a sufficient length of time which would allow them a decent return on their investment. And our understanding, at least, is that that, that aspect of our, our, our recommendations is fairly widely accepted by industry uh, and that landlords are not uh, particularly hostile to that and can see the advantages of that. Um, our recommendations would allow landlords to let land for much shorter periods of time, but they have slightly more onerous obligations with regard to providing fixed equipment of a suitable standard, at least at the outset of the tenancy. So what we think our, our, our proposal achieves is uh, proportional fairness from both sides uh, of the industry for that particular issue, which is letting out a farm with very poor or non-existent fixed equipment, where the landlord doesn't want to take any obligation. 
uh, again, I, I absolutely understand everything you're saying, but I, I merely just leave it with you as a thought that the, the needs to... If, if you really want to restore that confidence and bring that extra land onto the market, I think we need to be talking about maybe a maximum of 35 years rather than a minimum of 35 years. And I'll maybe just leave that with you as a thought. I don't know if other members want to come in on this before we, we move on to SLDTs. Yeah. Section, but not on this issue, convener. Well, Shall it's I? not part of our next uh, thoughts. It's something right, separate. Just, okay, go on. Sorry, convener, I was just wondering if Andrew, Andrew Thin had wanted to come in on this. Sorry, the vast majority of new supply will come forward on a, uh, an LDT at 10, 15, 20 years. The vast majority. There's some quite unhelpful communication. I think there's some clarification needed here. There's some unhelpful communication being chucked around at the moment about 35 <coughs> years. 35 years minimum only applies to conversion of secure tenancies and, and these really quite relatively unusual full repairing leases. The vast majority of supply will not be anywhere near that. And I think there's a We've got a job to communicate that. Yeah. So, Claudia, yes. Convener. Um, it was in relation to limited partnership tenancies, which obviously the committee's looked at a lot, and um, there may well be good reason, but I was disappointed to s not to see, uh, unless I've missed it, much about um, limited partnership tenancies in the, in the review um, recommendations. And... Um, it's, going to, it's an emotive word I'm going to use, but I'm going to use the word the plight of those who are in, in this difficult situation at the moment, really are through no fault of their own. And um, I see that the STFA believes it's essential to put some measure in place to afford these tenants greater protection before solutions can be found to give them a stable and secure future. And one suggestion that um, the STFA makes is the possibility of granting a right to convert their tenancies to LDTs. And I wondered if new Cabinet Secretary or other members of the panel had any comment on this or more broadly on, on the situation of limited partnership tenancies. I'll make a couple of comments briefly, but I, I know colleagues uh, will want to come in on this. Uh, my initial response was, yes, it is a, it is a challenging issue in the, the committee or the review group uh, did have a, a lot of conversations about limited partnerships. I guess my answer would be twofold. Firstly, limited partnerships in the past perhaps have arisen out of consequences from other measures, and therefore the review group's focus was on trying to get the other things right that perhaps in the past led to limited partnerships. So we're trying to focus on the, the root issues. Secondly, limited partnerships are so variable and there are so many different circumstances out there to do with limited partnerships that if you were to pick one circumstances that created limited partnerships and then come up with recommendations that addressed all limited partnerships, you could be intervening in many, many good relationships that are out there where limited partnerships play a valid role. So it's quite difficult to come up with simple recommendations that, uh, you know, are a catch-all for all the different circumstances out there. So it's, it's just quite a complicated situation. Um, therefore, the, the review group took the view that, yes, there are issues with limited partnerships, and we need the industry to, to tease out those issues and perhaps come up with some solutions, as opposed to us being able to come up with solutions, given what I've just said. I don't know if colleagues want to come in on that. Andrew? Can I, first of all, um, we very much, very strongly agreed and thought very hard about this, that the desirable outcome would be that these things are converted to LDTs. There's absolutely no argument about that whatsoever. Um, there are two reasons why we decided not to recommend that that's made mandatory or compulsory through statute. One, one was, and again I come back to this point about the impact on confidence, which uh, in the landowning community we felt that it would have a significant impact on confidence and it was undesirable. And the second was that because most of these things are already very close to the end of their lives, that it might well lead to a flurry of terminations and actually be counterproductive. Um, however, there is a recommendation, and I want to underline the recommendation, which is that the industry moves fast to get in place code processes and so on uh, to, to make it highly likely that the majority will be converted into LDTs unless there's good reason for not doing so. And I think that's an issue that the Commissioner might then follow through on later. And I know, because we're helping them, that the industry is working on a code right now. It's already drafted. I do appreciate. Th thank you for that. Um, 
uh, Andrew Thin, but I, I also do appreciate having found it quite hard to grapple, frankly, with the different groups within the um, limited partnerships, you know, when we were looking at it in committee because of the complexities. But I wouldn't want those often quite small numbers, but of, of very vulnerable um, tenants to be left in a difficult situation. And I'm not sure that I would agree with you, Cabinet Secretary, about the, the issue of simply because it wasn't, it was a, a consequence of something that therefore one shouldn't be addressing it within the review. Sure. No, and, and to, I take on board your comments. I think the point I was trying to make was in terms of new limited partnerships being created in the future, hopefully, through the recommendations, other vehicles will be more attractive. Uh, Dave Thompson, a, a supplementary. Yeah, thank you, Convener. It was just maybe to get a little bit more information on the thinking as to why 35 years was appropriate and not 50 or 90 on the conversion from 91 tenancies to... Well, my, my simple answer to that, again, colleagues who want to come in, is that 35 years was seen as a career in farming and therefore to make it attractive long-term certainty stability confidence 35 years is a career and you can have a career in agriculture and be a farmer for your your working life so next year me <laughs> 35 years you've been working i've not been minister for 35 years yet <laughs> <coughs> i'm only a third of the week <laughs> So 35 years, perhaps not in politics, but for agriculture is seen as a sensible length of time for a career and, and is more attractive. But I'll, I don't know if there are any other views that want to come in 35-year limits. It, touching on, on earlier comments which I made, which was that uh, we envisage in the main uh, the people who are bidding for the 35-year converted secure tenancy will be people who are on the second rung of the tenanted uh, farming ladder, and they're likely to be people in their mid to late 30s or perhaps early 40s, that a 35-year vehicle would be a suitable vehicle to take them through to retirement uh, and give them a, a productive working life on the, on the unit, uh, balancing all of the other interests which, would be, uh, which were involved. If I may convene, I just have one very quick follow-up. That would take them to the end of their working life, but then they don't have anything of value to sell at the end of it because the tenancy will be nearly over. So two or three years is not going to have much value, whereas if it was a bit longer, then they could retire at 60, 65 or 70 and still have something worth passing on to someone else, selling to, to someone else. But really any length of period has the ultimate problem. Mr. Thompson, so that uh, at some stage there will be a tenancy which is coming to an end and therefore doesn't have a value based on its duration at least, but there will be a certain amount of value built up, uh, for example, in the tenant's investment which be, can be compensated at, at WIGO. Right, we'll move on to uh, new entrants, I think. Oh, sorry. It's, oh, Alec Ferguson, first of all. Another uh, th question on SLDT. Thank you. Yes. This is quite a brief one, I think, um, which, which, which is simply... We, we've had a lot of evidence, um, particularly from the agricultural sector, to suggest strongly... I mean, Andrew Thin quite rightly has mentioned that most of the new lets will be 10, 15, 20 years, and, and I absolutely accept that. Um, but we have been given evidence that there is a need for something between one and ten years, particularly for some different forms of agricultural practice, fruit growers um, and, and others. But there is a need for something in between. Um, can, can I ask very basically, is, is it the intention of the recommendations that SLDTs be abolished, basically, and w what are your thoughts on something between one and ten years? Well, we are aware of some concerns expressed by the agricultural sector and the point I would make is that we don't have closed minds or clearly I don't have closed mind because now it's in the hands of the government to take forward and implement the recommendations. So I don't have a closed mind on this and I'm listening closely to the representations that we made for the need not to scrap the shorter uh, tenancies and if there is a requirement to maintain the five year limited duration tenancies or whatever you know, I, I'm, I'm chewing that over at the moment. Uh, clearly, what we have here is a set of recommendations from the review group. We have to now translate that into legislation where appropriate. They don't all require legislation. So, you know, 
I, I'm hearing what people say, and we're flexible on that. Now, can I, just to follow that up very briefly, would you be minded to bring forward recommendation? Would you be minded to, to have this in the legislation addressed, or, or would you be more? Is it more likely to be through amendment to the legislation? Well, I suspect that you know we should take a decision on that quite soon, so we can reflect it in the legislation. Fine. Now we can move on to new entrants and uh, reducing barriers to entry. Sarah Boy. Yes, it's been quite. I mean, the last few minutes we have actually been talking about um, intergenerational issues, but how people who are tenants might pass on to the next generation. There's also proactively how we create new opportunities for a new generation of tenants um, on new land. And the recommendations 36 and 37 um, in the report, I just want to tease out them. 36 is about um, publicly owned land, whether it's Forestry Commission, Crown Estate land, or whether the Scottish Government itself might potentially buy new land that could be made available for tenants. I think that's um, exciting, so I'd like some comments on how you see that happening. Um, the second recommendation is about beginning of a dialogue with um, landowners of particularly large agricultural estates um, to talk to them about how they might create more opportunities for new entrants. So I'm interested both in the public sector opportunities from existing public sector land, forestry commission, crown estate, or new land that you might buy. Um, or also, it could, of course, be community new land. Um, the other angle, though, is um, how you see the private sector bringing forward new opportunities for lettings. OK. Uh, well, it's a subject close to my heart, and I think it's important that the government looks for cases to intervene on behalf of the public interest to ensure that we have new opportunities opened up for new entrants in Scotland. And you'll be familiar with the fact that a few years ago I asked the Forestry Commission to look at using publicly owned land under their remit to create starter units. And also recently we used the uh, opportunity of Scottish Government own and run land to create a starter unit outside Inverness at Bal Roberts. And I went and met the family there and the young children, the, the young family. Uh, and it was very exciting to speak to them on government-owned land that's been created into a new starter unit. So we are using government-owned land, Forestry Commission land, to create starter units. And I'm very, very open for, uh, for looking for further opportunities to use publicly-owned land to have starter units for new entrants into agriculture in Scotland. Uh, <clears throat> the recommendations we're discussing today will help, but clearly we know there are still going to be obstacles in some shape or form to having opportunities for new entrants and therefore I am open to radical solutions uh, and we are currently investigating further radical solutions uh, and other ways in which we can use publicly owned land to create even more starter units. Mm -hmm. I think we'll soon have 11 new starter units created in Scotland through publicly owned land but I clearly want to continue to investigate how we can increase that number dramatically in the times ahead. In terms of private states and agricultural estates, I should say that, ironically, we have a lot of measures we're discussing today to open up new opportunities for tenancies and for new entrants, but if we had the tax powers in this parliament, the need for a lot of this would perhaps not be as great as what it is just now because we could just use fiscal measures in the tax system to incentivise let land in Scotland. So I think one of the easiest ways and, and most sensible ways to incentivise large estates and agricultural holdings to make more land available for letting is to use the tax system to put in incentives. Now, depending on the powers this Parliament acquires through the current uh, constitutional um, arrangements and debate, that may become possible, who knows, in the foreseeable future. If not, we may have to continue to make representations to the UK Government. But I do think that tax powers and tax incentives are certainly an important way forward for encouraging the large estates to make more land available for letting. That's our next question, Minister. Um, can I just go back to the issue about how you identify new land? Um, to what extent are you doing work on a regional basis? You've mentioned the opportunity you've been able to bring about in Inverness. Are you asking public sector or private sector organisations to identify land? And is there a, a regional aspect to this in terms of areas where we are particularly short of um, new tenant opportunities? 
Well, what we've found is that there are, in some respects, in a positive way, a huge number of people in Scotland who want to let land and new starter units, and that is very encouraging and optimistic for the future of agriculture. But the negative side of that, of course, is unfortunately we can't find land for everyone that wants it in Scotland at the moment because the, uh, the supply is not keeping up with demand. So we do have to keep looking for more opportunities. Our agencies are actively looking for opportunities to let more land and, you know, the Forestry Commission have come forward with proposals, the Scottish Government relevant directorates have come forward with proposals, so they're proactively looking. In terms of the regional approach, the, the, the many young people who want to find a farm will go effectively anywhere in Scotland to farm. So what we do find is the applicants for the starter units that become available um, are from all over Scotland. So whether it's uh, in Inverness Shire or whether it's in another part of Scotland, we find people from all over the country apply. So maybe that's a sign of the, the fact there's such a severe lack, but it also is a, a sign that people are very enthusiastic and you know, clearly it's a great opportunity to get a farm, so they're willing to, to move to do that. Um, so we don't have a regional approach per se in terms of identifying regional shortages. Perhaps we should do, and I'm not saying that's a, a bad idea, it's certainly something I'll give thought to. That's very helpful, uh, Cabinet Secretary. And the recommendation 38 was about new financial support. You've mentioned tax, which um, is going to come next, but there was also the issue about using... Um, in, sorry, I was just going to say tax. incentives from um, larger established operators to redirect to new entrants. I wonder if you'd say a little bit more about how you see that would work um, and what the impact would be on, on existing operators. Well, all I can really say at this point in time is... You know, the recommendations there and we have to consider how to take it forward but I, I can say that I do believe there are big players out there in Scotland that can help and can do more and we have to have a better dialogue with them and ask them to be creative to open up opportunities for new entrants. In terms of financial instruments again there is a belief that there's more that can be done to help it, it help uh, make the financial support available for new entrants. Clearly within the Rural Development Programme there's grants, but in terms of lending from banks or other vehicles, there's perhaps more we can do there to try and have bespoke packages for new entrants in Scotland, and that's something we want to explore. Thank you. Um, Hamish Lean talked in an earlier answer about uh, tenants who were in the second rung of the ladder. But getting from a new entrance holding to the second rung is something which I'd like to explore a little with you just now because are there barriers to uh, entry into the second rung as there are barriers to entry into first time holdings? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure there are and, and clearly <coughs> the recommendations are aimed at having a, a more fluid tenancy sector in Scotland so that all farmers at all stages of their career hopefully find there's more opportunities there because overall there's different letting vehicles and it's more attractive to let land. So you know, clearly that's the outcome we're seeking. Um, I don't know if in your experience or do you have any comments on the second rung? Essentially the principal barrier at second rung stage, if you like, is uh, availability of supply of opportunity, which of course is what we're trying to address. Okay. Andrew Reed, then. The recommendation on tenants on tenancy apprenticeships is entirely relevant here because the main the main barrier is the shortage of supply, as Hamish says. The other barrier is is, is capital. Um, if you can stage that transfer, so you can stage the acquisition, including working your way into it, which does happen in other countries, you can you you, you can you can stage the the, the 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 requirement for the capital. And that's one of the most exciting recommendations in the reports. And one I'm very proud of is the fact that we are a bit innovative. And if we can find opportunities for effectively apprentices in agriculture to have a staged um, transfer of tenancies over time, that will be a really exciting, innovative route for new entrants into agriculture. Good. Uh, thanks. I'm glad I asked that. Um, any points on taxation, Angus Macdonald, have not been covered already? <coughs> Yes, yeah, thanks, Convener. Just uh, picking up on, on, on the, the, the issue of uh, 
of tax incentives, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Um, clearly, there's, uh, there's some examples of where there could be assistance with, with regard to, uh, well, for example, VAT e exemption on, on letting land or the, the way that rent is treated as investment income rather than a trading income. Um, have you or your officials had any discussions to date with the UK Government about changes uh, to reserve taxes uh, which, which could encourage the, the, the letting of land? Or is that an option for the future? Well, I think tax incentives and fiscal measures are very important tools for opening up new opportunities for let land in Scotland. It's the one thing that would make a material difference and very quickly and could be transformational if we got it right. They would have to be designed very, very carefully, the, the specific fiscal measures. But clearly, if we affect you know, the tax bills of large estate owners, it's one incentive uh, that would perhaps lead to more late land in Scotland. Unfortunately, when I have raised this with UK ministers in the past, I get the blank stares. And I wish we could persuade uh, UK ministers this is quite a big, important priority in Scotland. Uh, and, you know, we have made representations in the past. We have a UK election in a few weeks. And what I can say to the committee is I'll be making, again, strong representations to the, the next set of UK ministers uh, to persuade them that these measures will be really helpful to Scotland. But not only that, it would be far easier, of course, if the, the powers were transferred to this parliament uh, and we could just do it ourselves. Um, just before I bring in Jim uh, Hume, uh, on this matter, uh, incentives, yes, but uh, underlying the availability of land is the fact that the value, the saleable value, is far in excess of the economic value of units. And uh, when you talk about uh, encouraging landlords to lease land uh, to tenants, um, we'd need to try in the system, not just to think about incentives, but perhaps I heard a hint there, you know, about the tax bills of estates and so on. Um, I'd be interested to know if you have any further proposals about how we're going to get land values back in uh, kilter with the actual economic value, because at the present time, it's ridiculously expensive for anyone getting onto any rung in the agricultural ladder at this time. It is, and to understand the underlying factors behind land values in Scotland, I think you'd need um, Albert Einstein to come and give us a helping hand because it's so unbelievably uh, complicated. And it is, of course, incredible that in some cases barren land in Scotland not doing anything is, is worth millions of pounds uh, due to people not wanting to invest in perhaps less secure less tangible assets, given uh, the recent experience over the last few years of what's happened with the banks. <clears throat> However, we're not talking about ownership necessarily here. We're talking about land that could be let. And of course, the land would still be owned by whoever owns it, and therefore by an, an income from letting it. So what we have to do is find ways in which we can incentivize that. Because ironically, we have ongoing references during this discussion to the lack of availability of land. There's actually plenty of land in Scotland. It's just not being put on the market for let. Uh, and therefore, that's the key point here we have to address. OK, uh, Jim Hume. Thanks very much, Convener. Uh, the UK budget, budget, as you will know, has just uh, announced that uh, income tax for, for farming uh, will be smoothed over five years rather than two years. I just wonder if that was something you'd welcomed and something that you'd been pushing for with any of the ministers in the UK? Uh, yes, we do welcome the fact that farmers have been afforded op the opportunity under the recent budget to average their, their tax management over a five-year period, which is particularly helpful to the dairy sector, for instance, given the volatility uh, recently with, with uh, dairy prices. Um, clearly, that is the first measure we've seen in quite a while, uh, and it's a modest step forward for those farmers who will benefit from that. But what we're speaking about here is actually getting some incentives into the system that will encourage the letting of land uh, in Scotland. Sarah Boyack. Just to follow up on that point, your recommendation 41 
was to look at the whole issue of non-domestic rates in advance of the 2017 revaluation um, and the suggestion by the Land Reform Review Group um, that you should be looking at land value taxation. I was wondering if that's something you've had a discussion with the local government minister on because that's a, a fairly major piece of work that's being done as I understand it, over the next year to look at scope to change or maybe think about uh, local authority taxation? Well, clearly I communicated the, the views of the review group on that and the commission that's been set up to look into local taxation will be considering those issues. So they'll have the opportunity to do that and it will happen. And of course, I think no doubt your committee will want to pay close attention to that. Thank you. That's fine. Are there any other points now that people wish to uh, make? If not, uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we look forward to developing these matters, and there's many more that flow from them. Uh, it's been a most useful session, and uh, thank you to you and your uh, supportive uh, officials. Uh, and the, the review group itself has been a very, very big help, I think, after what seems to me to be a very long period of time in trying to reach this point where we might make a breakthrough. I, I'll be slightly optimistic. The glass is half full. We'll see what happens next. So thank you very much for that. We have another item in public in a minute, but we'll just clear the, uh, the decks just now and have a very brief uh, recess.
just now. And that final item uh, is item four before we go into private. Uh, it's with regard to consideration of PE 01490 or zero by Patrick Krauser on behalf of the uh, Scottish Crofting Federation on the control of wild geese numbers. I refer members to the paper and I invite comments from members on the petition. Mike Russell. Yeah, I, I think the goose issue is, well, is a declaration of interest in constituency, but the goose um, issue is an example of you get to experience everything twice in life. I experience it as minister and I now experience it as a member for Hagal and Butte with the a very severe goose problem. I just want convener to draw attention to two documents which I think are important. The first is the Isla Goose Strategy, drawn up um, by the uh, SNH, amongst others. And paragraph 1.5, this was last October, paragraph 1.5 reads, the strategy is required for two reasons. The first is damage by barnacle geese on Isla, continuing at a level which causes serious agricultural damage. Ongoing high levels of damage threaten the viability of farming on Isla, which underpins economic and social viability, as well as providing wider biodiversity benefits. At the same time, in December 2014, just shortly after that was issued, there was a press release from the RSPB. And Stuart Housden is quoted as saying, we believe that the evidence base on which the cull, and there was no cull, is proposed is fundamentally uh, inadequate. We fully acknowledge that grazing geese sometimes affect agricultural operations, but past experience on Isla has shown that with barnacle goose numbers at their current level on the island, less destructive means of managing these impacts are available. Now, the reality is, over 10 years or more, there has been an attempt to get a, a, a bridge between those two positions. The bridge that's the, the one position that says the increasing goose numbers, even very high numbers that they're at now, which seem moderately stable, are entirely tolerable and create no difficulty. And those who are actually on the ground, who are running farms, who are running crofts, and are seeing the damage that's taking place. And the reality is that the damage remains considerable. And whilst there is an attempt, and I pay tribute to the Scottish Government for continued attempts to try and make sure that there is a reconciliation of these positions, those positions have not been adequately reconciled. And Patrick Carosa is quite right to draw attention to the fact that there needs to be more substantial action to protect the livelihoods of those who are involved in the Western Isles, in Orkney to some extent, but certainly in the Argyle Islands, and now increasingly on the Argyle mainland, where the number of barnacle geese continues to rise. I very rarely hold constituency surgeries in Lismore or Campbellton or Kintyre or Gia, and increasingly even uh, further into Argyle that I don't get people saying to me that the goose numbers is ca are causing them considerable problems in their, the running of their farms or crofts. I don't think that this is resolved. I think it requires considerably more work. And I think there also needs to be a recognition that the, Euro the, the convention that governs this does give derogation to those farmers and crofters who find that their crops and livelihoods are being adversely affected. And I think that the right attitude to this petition is to take the issue back to the Scottish Government and to press the Scottish Government to get the widest possible derogation for agriculture so that the, 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 the existence of agriculture in fragile parts of Scotland is not actually put at risk by what is taking place. Alec Ferguson, then Sarah Boyack. Can I, um, again, using a, a constituency theme here, very much endorse uh, what Mike Russell has just said. I'm grateful that the communication problems that led to the Solway scheme not providing um, evidence to us, written evidence uh, earlier, um, was resolved and that they have been able to do so. And indeed, I'm grateful that the minister felt able to meet with them fairly recently. Um, both here in the Parliament and indeed she visited the, the Solway scheme on site. Uh, uh, that scheme has been hugely successful. It has doubled the number of Svalbard barnacle grease. It's the only place in Scotland where they come to, um, and, and it's a very important part of their life cycle. But the fact is, and it's, it's a, the, the, the problems that the farmers are facing is now exacerbated by the fact that the cap reforms are reducing the amount of support available to farmers in that part of Scotland. And these guys, are, a lot of them, are at the end of their tether and now threatening to come out of the scheme. Um, that would be a disaster, given the amount of funding, the amount of resource that's gone into it so successfully over the years. And I, I very much endorse the position taken by um, Mike Russell, though in regard to my constituents in the Solway scheme, um, which is, I think, the second biggest after the Isla scheme, I think. 
So, uh, Sarah Boyack. Thank you very much, Convener. I had four brief points I wanted to make. Firstly, I think it demonstrates the need for continued data gathering and analysis so that we can see what schemes are effective and which are value for money. Um, secondly, I think the point that I think was partly made by Mike Russell, but certainly made in the response from Patrick Krauser, which is about the balancing between food production and wildlife management. And I think getting the analysis of the research is actually quite important to guide that investment for the future. Um, thirdly, you can definitely see um, investment in different geographical areas making a big difference. And I think learning the lessons from that is quite important going forward. And then fourthly, um, the point about goose meat opportunities, I thought that was quite an interesting issue to pick up in the context of we're in the year of food and drink. Um, and just looking at the opportunities, um, either for public procurement or for new market research, so that where um, geese are actually um, culled, that, that there's something that comes from that that's a positive byproduct. And I think it would be good to go back to the ministers and, and raise the particular issues that colleagues have also mentioned. Thank you for that. Uh, so we've got Angus MacDonald first, then me, and then Graham. Okay, uh, thanks, Convener. I certainly agree with uh, Mike Russell's point uh, and, and Sarah Boyack's that uh, uh, the issue is not yet um, addressed properly and, uh, and does need further action. I think uh, the submission from the Scottish Crofting Federation it has raised a number of uh, further points or, or existing points which still require uh, clarification uh, from the Scottish Government. Um, for example, uh, there's, there's still an issue in the Eusts. Um, they, they haven't hit their, their, their targets, um, so it has to be asked whether SNH is failing to deliver on this. Um, although on a, a plus point, it, it's worth noting that uh, the programme in Lewis, the Isle of Lewis, is, is underway uh, and the government is allowing the sale of uh, goose meat on, on Lewis and Harris as well as, uh, as a use. So, so that's a plus, but um, we're still not where we want to be and uh, I think the government need to uh, clarify a number of points as pointed out by the Scottish Crofting Federation. Well, I'd like to make a point about the Uists. And uh, in this very room last night, we had uh, a celebration of the 2015 UN International Year of Soils. And uh, the Chief Executive of uh, Scottish Natural Heritage, Susan Davies, pointed out that the two major issues they were tackling in this are one, the peatland issues, which we know much about, but also the fragile mackers and Uists, particularly. And these uh, issues have to come into play when we're talking about the way in which geese affect the fragile nature of uh, that, those grazings and uh, those, uh, th those lands and ewes. So there's very good reason why uh, we need to take those into account, and they haven't been taken into account in the government's response at the present time. Graham? Uh, yeah, convener, I'm thankful I don't have a constituency. Uh, interest in this regard, but it is nevertheless a hugely important issue. And I think the answers that we've received thus far from the government, by any reasonable judgment, uh, have not been as comprehensive as we were seeking. I think Patrick Krauser has used the words uh, incomplete and inadequate. I think that's a fair assessment. So I think as a parliamentary committee, we should be pursuing both the lack of response to the specific questions that we've posed uh, alongside the very important on the ground issues that uh, colleagues have uh, noted. That kind of sums up, in a way, what we're needing to have done. We need to go back to the government, I think, at the present time and get those answers. Uh, and if we're agreed, uh, then we should uh, write to the government on the basis of uh, Patrick Krause's arguments and back them up by saying that we'd like complete answers as soon as possible from the government. Are we agreed? We are agreed. In that case, uh, we'll go into private after this. Uh, at our next meeting, uh, the 22nd of April, we'll consider the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007 Fixed Penalty Notices Order. Uh, and uh, I wish everybody a uh, great Easter recess. So we'll now move into private. <laughs>